I'm gonna show you how to spot a narcissist before it's too late by looking at these core signs. And I actually found that one sign might be the key to unlocking the whole thing by itself. All right, but let's first start at the beginning. Now, if you're not familiar, there's this widely circulated graphic going around the internet that basically describes something called the narcissistic abuse cycle. It looks like this. Now, this cycle has four distinct parts. The idealization stage, which is often referred to as this honeymoon period stage. And it's basically where the narcissist places you on a pedestal. Now, this stage often leaves you feeling intoxicated, consumed, and quite frankly, a little excited. It's basically all full of hope and potential. Next comes the devaluation stage. This is essentially where the narcissist begins to lose interest in you. You're basically no longer their top priority. And as a result, you're subsequently dethroned. Essentially, you've lost all value to them. Then comes the discard stage. They basically break up with you or sever whatever connection they have with you. Because they have no more use for you, they discard you or they find someone new to fulfill their needs. More on that later. Then of course we have the Hoover stage, lovingly named after the Hoover vacuum cleaner. This is where the narcissist attempts to draw you back into their orbit. You'll basically see a glimpse of the person that they used to be very similar to what they were doing during the idealization stage. They essentially pull you back in and then you basically go around and around multiple times throughout this cycle from idealization to devaluation to discarding back to hoovering back to idealization you get the picture so obviously if you're sitting here and seeing this and thinking this is hitting a little too close to home that might be a major red flag that you are with a narcissist but actually, when I first stumbled across the narcissistic abuse cycle, the first thing that came to my mind was how similar it was to my avoidant death wheel graphic. And this really got me thinking, what attachment style in general are narcissists? Well, if you go by what the comments on our YouTube channel say, you would probably believe that most narcissists are dismissive avoidance. After all, pretty much every single avoidant video that I do gets comments like this. So what I'd like to do is actually figure out if our commenters are correct. Check this out. This is a timeline of all the relevant reputable research I could find on attachment theory and narcissism. So it basically all starts in 1998 when two researchers named Brennan and Shaver found a possible relation between the narcissistic personality disorder and the insecure attachment features. They basically reported a range of attachment representations of both anxiety and avoidance on individuals with narcissistic traits. Then in 2003, two more researchers named Dickinson and Pincus enter the fray. Now Dickinson and Pincus reveal that individuals with high grandiose narcissism reported having a secure and or avoidant attachment style, while individuals with vulnerable narcissism reported having the anxious, ambivalent, or the fearful attachment style. So what is grandiose narcissists versus vulnerable narcissists? Well, someone with a grandiose narcissistic personality is going to have a very inflated sense of self-importance. They will often believe that they're superior to others and deserve special treatment. You'll find that they're often outgoing, charming, confident, and their behavior can be a little domineering and assertive. They're often going to seek admiration and attention from others. They'll, they're less sensitive to criticism compared to the vulnerable narcissists that we're going to talk about in a moment, but they may respond to criticism with anger or dismissal rather than hurt or insecurity. You'll find that they have a lot of superficial relationships. They often value others primarily based on how they can serve their needs or enhance their status, and they have a high self-esteem. It's often overt and unshaken by failures or criticism. They'll maintain their self-esteem through external validation, achievements, and dominance. Vulnerable narcissists, on the other hand, have a high sense of self-importance as well, but it's coupled with significant insecurity. They're sensitive to how others view them. They'll often feel misunderstood or undervalued. You'll find that they're more introverted and can appear shy or withdrawn. Their need for admiration and attention is strong, but not as openly expressed as in grandiose narcissism. 
vulnerable narcissists will be highly sensitive to criticism and rejection. They'll experience it as a deep personal attack. This can lead them to have these feelings of shame or helplessness or sometimes even anger. Their relationships are often characterized by a constant need for reassurance and validation. They will feel dissatisfied with the level of support and understanding they receive from others, and their self-esteem is incredibly fragile and will fluctuate based on the perceptions of how well they are regarded by others. You'll find that they're going to internally struggle a lot with feelings of inadequacy or vulnerability. So basically, going back to what our good friends Dickinson and Pincus found, they actually found that grandiose narcissists can have secure attachment styles, but mostly you're going to see them with avoidant attachment styles. Vulnerable narcissists, on the other hand, will have an anxious or fearful avoidant attachment style. And then 2005 rolls around and we get new research on the topic. A couple of disruptors in Smolowska and Dion, they basically argue that it's actually vulnerable narcissism that is found to be linked to insecure dimension of attachment anxiety. They're essentially saying that they have a hugely high confidence in the area of fearful avoidant and anxious attachment behavior being linked to vulnerable narcissists. Well, exactly one year later in 2006, you get two more researchers that basically corroborate what Smolowska and Dion were saying. Vulnerable narcissists are connected to anxious or fearful avoidant attachment theory styles. Then about 10 years later, we get more research on the matter. A woman named Andrea Fassati, she expanded on the idea showing essentially that narcissism is significantly related to the insecure attachment dimensions of anxiety and avoidance. So here's what we've learned. If you want to spot a narcissist from an attachment style perspective, you're going to want to look at three things. Hypothesis number one, both types of narcissism, grandiose and vulnerable, will have a positive and statistically significant correlation with the insecure attachment dimensions, anxiety and avoidance. Hypothesis two, vulnerable narcissism will be a stronger predictor of the attachment anxiety dimension in relation to grandiose narcissism. Hypothesis three, grandiose narcissism will be a stronger predictor of the avoidant attachment dimension in relation to vulnerable narcissism. But I also think one of the clear factors for helping us spot a narcissist has a lot to do with this concept of narcissistic supply. Narcissistic supply is the most sought after commodity for a narcissist. Now, if you're unfamiliar, narcissistic supply is essentially the validation, emotional response, or even physical intimacy that they can extract from others. Think of it like their lifeblood. Every narcissist needs supply to survive. We actually see this a lot with exes. Given their shared history with this individual, the narcissist is aware that they can manipulate that individual to essentially get their supply. One of the things that I try to explain to my clients who feel that they are dating a narcissist is that a narcissist does not look at a human being as a human being. A narcissist looks at a human being as a source of supply, and that supply can come in many different forms. Emotional support for some, attention and admiration for others, physical intimacy for a few, companionship during a gym session, or simply someone to converse with during a walk. These are all examples of sources of supply. To a narcissist, individuals are merely vessels to prop up their egos. And the narcissist ultimately gets power and control out of it. And here's the crazy part. The concept of supply isn't an everlasting concept. It actually kind of mirrors a drug addict's pursuit. They seek the hit, they revel in the high, but once that high wanes, the hunt resumes and round and around we go. And it's this constant practice of hunting and looking for the next hit that has led a narcissist to becoming a master manipulator. And no, in case you're wondering, this isn't the research that I stumbled on that is mind blowing that I don't think anyone ever talks about. That's actually gonna come a little bit later in this video. But a defining characteristic of a narcissist is their compulsion to control. And one of the ways that they do that is using guilt. Now, one of the most disturbing instances of narcissism that we have seen a lot of is a narcissist's ability to use guilt by threatening self-harm. Now, what usually happens is that the individual on the receiving end of this threat, well, they feel obligated to adhere to whatever the narcissist wants. And it's 
all a result of fear. The narcissist understands that you fear what the narcissist will do because you'll feel guilty and they take advantage of that and they manipulate you. But why? What is the point of this? What do they get out of this? Well, the behavior can stem for a lot of different things or reasons. You know, it could be something as simple as attention seeking tendencies, a desire for sympathy, their incessant need for a narcissistic supply hit. So essentially every time that you give them attention, every time that they get sympathy from you, well, you're literally filling up their supply like a battery. And it all stems from their incessant need for control. Let's go back to the narcissistic abuse cycle graphic for a moment. Do you see that Hoover stage? All this manipulation through guilt is happening there. And that's only one manipulation strategy that they'll employ to suck you back in. But it gets even wilder. You see, a narcissist lacks compassionate empathy. It's really important to understand that people can generally be selfish without being narcissistic. The difference really lies in the fact that selfish people can display compassionate empathy. Narcissists cannot. All right, so what the heck is compassionate empathy? Well, it goes beyond feeling another person's perspectives and feelings. It even goes beyond recognizing what another person is experiencing. It's essentially about being moved to help a person if that's what they need. So think of compassionate empathy as being divided into like four core quadrants, if you will. You have emotional recognition. This is someone's ability to identify what a person is feeling. Then of course you have emotional resonance. You know, this is feeling the emotions that are similar to the other person's emotion. Then of course you have understanding, which is all about comprehending the situation or circumstances that are causing the person's feeling. And then you have the motivation to act. Now, a key differentiator of compassionate empathy from other forms of empathy, such as cognitive empathy, which is kind of all about understanding someone else's perspective, and emotional empathy, which is all about essentially sharing someone else's feelings. Compassionate empathy moves one step further. It's about creating a desire to alleviate that person's stress. Now, here's where it really gets tricky. Distinguishing between someone with compassionate empathy and someone with cognitive empathy can be a little tricky. Narcissists are really adept at mimicking genuine empathy. Now, one potential indicator to help you understand the difference is if your partner offers comfort, but then essentially expects something in return for that comfort. It could be sex, it could be rides from work, material possessions, assistance with whatever. And this is all in exchange for their consolation. Now, if you start to notice this pattern, it's a definite red flag. But perhaps one of the most heartbreaking aspects to spotting a narcissist is the micromanager aspect to it. I actually wanna talk about Jewel a little bit. Now, Jewel's story is really interesting. She left home at 15, and despite the odds being stacked against her, she became a multi-million dollar record seller. Yet one of the reasons that she left home was to escape her home life. Her mother left her at eight. Her father became an alcoholic and abusive for a while. Now, after Jewel strikes it big in the music industry, guess who surfaces? Yep, her, her mom comes out of the woodwork. And her mother basically manipulates Jewel into letting her be a business manager for her. How did she manipulate Jewel? Watch this. We went to Homer was pretty heartbreaking. And that ended up sort of creating this chain of events in my life where I really wanted her in my life. I wanted her love. And it ended up costing me a lot later. So basically, Jewel's mother takes advantage of her yearning for love. And of course, as Jewel's success soars, her mother really never lets her make any decisions herself. And it eventually gets to the point where Jewel catches her mother actually stealing money or misrepresenting it. And this ultimately leaves Jewel in debt. But when she was your manager, she was dramatically misrepresenting things and sort of misleading you. You ended up deeply in debt. I think the biggest betrayal for me was really on a personal level. Um, yeah, in hindsight, probably wasn't my best choice as a manager. Uh, but again, that relationship was really intense and having her come back in my life uh, meant a lot to me and I needed it. But here's the part that gets me. When Jewel confronts her mother about this, here's what the mother says. We can talk when you're ready to apologize to me. Now, I want you to take special note of the selfishness and the gaslighting at play here. Now, these are, of course, narcissistic traits. Now, while I acknowledge that a selfish person can steal from you, 
What I find particularly interesting about Jules' situation is the cold empathy that is exhibited by Jules' mother. Now, cold empathy, if you didn't know, is a narcissist's manipulative ability to understand and exploit other people's emotions without genuine concern or emotional engagement. We know from Jewel, from literally that interview, that Jewel wanted a relationship with her mother, missed her mother, yearned for her love. But instead, Jewel is tricked into making her mother her manager. The mother then micromanages every aspect of her life. And the control here is excessive, the theft, of course, being a result of that controlling behavior. Now, the ongoing debate between selfishness and narcissism, I believe, exists because so many narcissistic traits appear to be selfish. Yet it's true that many selfish people aren't narcissists. That's why it's so crucial to identifying the root cause of the narcissism. Now, as I stated earlier, narcissists do not view their victims as people. They view their victims as sources of supply. In Jules' case, her mother clearly sees her as a supply for money, which Jules' mother ultimately obtains, and then has no problem whatsoever discarding Jewel once that supply runs out. And now we come to the one bit of research that I rarely see people talking about when it relates to identifying narcissists, the uncanny valley. Now this concept is often overlooked when it comes to narcissists. So what the heck is it? Well, take a look at this. This is the uncanny valley. Now, the concept of the uncanny valley was founded by a man named Masahiro Mori, who was a professor at the Tokyo Institute of Technology way back in the 1970s. And he basically used this term to describe that as robots become increasingly human-like in their appearance and intellect, they become more appealing. However, there's a specific threshold at which they begin to appear eerie or unsettling. This, of course, is the uncanny valley. So if you've ever had this feeling that surfaces when you're in a relationship with someone or you just have this feeling that something is persistently off. It's like you're dealing with a person that resembles a human being, but there's nothing inside, like they have no soul. Well, this unsettling feeling is often attributed to relationships with narcissists because narcissists demonstrate cold empathy. Remember, our definition of cold empathy is it's the narcissist's manipulative ability to understand and exploit other people's emotions without genuine concern or emotional engagement. Ultimately, cold empathy makes narcissists seem robotic. Wild, right? It is their ultimate tell. So as corny as this is gonna sound, I think it's really important when trying to identify if you're with the narcissist or not to trust your gut. They maybe say all the right things at first, and maybe at first they even do all the right things, but you just sense that something is off. What you may be sensing is the uncanny valley. Trust your gut.